In one old episode of Digibot's Decompression Chamber, the 21st century digital boy in question recalls a discussion with their mentor Ghost Lightning in the Philippines. Digi comments on how they are often simply not in the mood to write. Ghost Lightning responds by asking, when are you going to stop letting these moods control you and start taking control of your moods? As I think of these words, I remember the most recent time I heard them, standing outside of a hospital building waiting to be seen for a problem I no longer remember. One might analyze illness as a form of oppression, taking away your agency about how your own body functions. In a similar sense, could we look at mood as a prison? Osaka Syndrome says as much in the latest video, which inspired this script and you should go watch if you haven't already. Going back to the Greeks and probably long before even then, man has struggled with its own position, trapped halfway between the beasts and the gods. We have the capacity for creative thought and action, future planning, introspection and understanding of the world, yet we're also chained by remnant animal instincts, emotional responses, need for basic sustenance, just free enough to know we're in prison. Of course, for the Greeks, the gods they knew too had emotional responses, rages, illogical behavior, yet they also had the ultimate freedom to act on them. Which brings me to the question of the Vulcan and the mountain man. Which is the correct liberatory position? to be free from emotion, or to emote freely. The Vulcan is not born without emotion, but through vigorous training attempts to escape its clutches, and only think logically. Kirk once called Spock a carcass full of memory banks. He sees a being without emotion as not truly alive. Ought we wish to be alive? The mountain man is free in his own way, free to allow his base programming to take over. While the Vulcan feels no fear, the mountain man knows to trust his, Fear honed into the tune of the environment, or perhaps joy at natural beauty, or even just finding something to eat. We live in strange times. Our instincts are no longer in step with our environment. Many of us have overactive fight-or-flight responsive responses activated by harmless stimuli. At least that's what science tells us an anxiety disorder is. Or you might characterize this as a natural response to a highly stressful environment in the shape of postmodernity. In my mind, we are much closer to beasts than we think ourselves. Humanist propaganda has told us we are exceptional for our logic and reason, and yet our greatest works are what? Great monuments to fictional gods of the past, or our irrational global economic system of the present? A system of medicine which extends our lives so we may suck up ever more resources? We breed like rats and we're no better. I think it's tempting to assign the achievements of man to our intellect, but really it's much more so a factor of our sociality. No man, no matter how smart, can build the Great Pyramids alone. We look outside our window and see the so-called natural environment has been replaced by the human environment, one of buildings and roads and shops and cars and clothing and streetlights, and we cannot help but see ourselves as exceptional. Yet the sociality of humans pales when compared to an ant or a termite or a bee. We see that ants build great megastructures on a relative to scale much greater than anything we ever have. We see that they have agriculture, we see that they too wage war, we see that they have the division of labor, and we do not stop to think, one ant is not so smart, yet they do all this, am I too not so smart? I think we desire the freedom to experience emotions on our own terms. When I was a teenager I was constantly told that I ne never thought before I acted. I was extremely impulsive and desperate for attention and validation. Then one day my environment changed radically. I completed my GCSEs and left school. Overnight, my personality transformed. I was still impulsive, that would take me years to overwrite, and I still don't know if I'll ever get there. But something fundamental had shifted. I felt like I now had a choice. Not about choosing to feel emotional responses, but choosing to act on them or not. Once again, the question arises, is it more liberating to never have to act on them, or to act on them freely? I do not think a human being can control their emotions truly, but emotions happen on levels. While I may not be able to control my physiological reactions to stimuli, I'm not helpless. Mike Tyson once said that discipline is doing something you hate as if you love it. What happened to all the warrior poets? I don't mean to sound like an expert. I am the opposite of one here, although it's not a monolith. I would say when it comes to tragedy or interpersonal issues, I'm generally quite apt at reining in my reactions to emotions. But when it comes to physical processes like exercising or eating, moving, inertia, well, I have much less skill. To an extent, one can compensate for the other, but that does not extend too far. Ultimately, this is a question of autonomy and ownership. 
Abstractions aside, when it comes to ownership, you only truly own what you can defend. This is normally mentioned in the context of defending your property with violence, but more importantly, you must own your own mind. Self-mastery is the ability to defend your own psyche from itself. One can be trapped by logical thought, unable to think freely. The schizo thinks freely. Learn the tools to unbind yourself from non-delusion. There is no such thing as drugs. Drugs cause an altered state of consciousness. In order for that to happen, there must first be such a thing as consciousness which can be in a state, but there is no such singular thing. I hate the human form. We're extremely counterintuitive. In order to grow your muscles, you must constantly create micro-tears. You have to make things difficult for yourself. To make your heart more powerful, you have to test it. If I want to get to the store as fast as possible, I might get in a vehicle. That's the most efficient way. The body doesn't care what's efficient. If you want to get good at walking to the store, you have to walk there yourself 10,000 times slowly. The mind is the same. The most efficient way to kill your anxiety will be to take a benzo or some similar drug. But if you want to actually get good, you have to take the path of most resistance and do it manually. When you lift weights, you have to purposely make it difficult for yourself, not using momentum, lifting slowly and deliberately. The exact same process applies to the mind. Not that I'm anti-drug in any sense, but I think moderation is itself more powerful than any drug. This is not an intervention, this is invention. The best way to get fit is to live in an environment which gives you no choice other than to use your body regularly. Temptation is an interesting sensation. See how useless our intellect is? That we even have the concept of temptation is the ultimate proof of our being only barely a hair's breadth more aware than an ant. Star Trek The Next Generation offers the counterpart to Spock in the form of Data, and the counterpart to Kirk in the form of Picard. When asked if he would sacrifice one life to save many, Picard replied, I refuse to let arithmetic decide questions like that. Picard offers in my mind the perfect role model. He is neither Vulcan nor Mountain Man. He allows himself to feel the breadth of emotion, positive, negative, and everything in between. As exemplified with that previous quote, he knows that on questions of humanity, it's illogical to deal only in pure logic. However, he's also constantly aware of his own responsibility as captain of a starship with hundreds of people's lives on the line. He does not act rashly or without consideration and endanger those who depend on him, even when his emotions tell him otherwise. Of course, he's still human, and he makes mistakes. Even further than that, it may be my favorite quote from the entire franchise, Picard says plainly, it's Im it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose, that is not a weakness, that is life. If I had to draw conclusions from this exercise, it would be firstly that there is no correct path, mountain man or Vulcan, and that we must remember that we are not so superior to our environment as we may think, and in many situations the optimal move is to bow your head to your environment and play the cards you've been dealt. When Picard says this about committing no mistakes, it is in the context of explaining to Data that regardless of any self-doubt you might have, as a serving officer aboard the ship, you have a duty larger than yourself to fulfill. I think this is an important factor. The Mountain Man and the Vulcan, they both have to put aside their attitudes because they both need to eat. Wittgenstein says it's imperative to live happily, exclamation mark. I take that command as a threat. At least you should live so, as you so choose. Do what thou wilt. If I will to misery, well, I don't know anymore. I give up. It's not my job to save the world. I just like Star Trek. Alright, I'm just going to improvise this bit because this did not have a satisfying conclusion. But that's because there can be no conclusion to be drawn. I'm really just trying to think about emotionality, rationality, the position of man among the beasts, the role of self-discipline, self-control, drugs, consciousness, a lot of big thoughts. But at the end of the day, I think my conclusion is it's, it's kind of something you have to decide for yourself and figure out what's best for you. That's what I'm saying when I say you have to bow down to your environment because people live in different situations, you know? If you're a physics professor... It's probably not a good idea to think emotionally about your maths or whatever. Although many do. So maybe I'm wrong about that. But, uh, you know, there's, if, you, if you're a doctor and you're trying to save someone's life, you should probably go on training rather than gut instinct. Uh, 
But if you're a mountain man and your gut instinct is attuned to your environment, then do what, do what, you know, do that. Like I would say, I have, after spending many, many years on the internet, I have a pretty good gut instinct for all things um, online. I can tell if I'm, if I'm on a page, you know, you know, those like sketchy sites where they have like five different download buttons, four of which are like browser hijackers one of them's real i can always tell which is the real one uh or for example my my friends that i know sometimes end up sending me videos that are obviously fake and not realizing they're fake or uh falling for scams and stuff whereas i i'm i I don't i have a pretty good attuned instinct to this stuff because i've spent a lot of time and i'm comfortable in that environment um and it's a matter of placing yourself in an, you know, there's no such thing as an environment that isn't hostile to humans. Being a human is to be in a, in a world that hates you, uh, in a body that hates you, in a mind that hates yourself. Uh, there is no environment that isn't hostile for humans. It's a challenge of survival and mitigation and harm reduction. And there's many tools at your disposal. Some of them are within your own mind. They're just about technique. Some of them are our external tools like um changing your diet behavior like or or changing your environment or drugs or anything like this um and there is no one correct solution for everyone it's going to dip- you know you need to figure out a good mixture uh, and i'm not saying i've got this figured out by the way in totality you know i i said i have a good gut instinct for the for for the interwebs but pretty much everything outside of that i suck at uh, like I don't have any gut instinct for human communication. I don't have any gut instinct for like being outside in the world, surrounded by other people, and like how how they're going to react to my presence and stuff like that. Uh, I, I there are a lot of things that I don't have any instinct for, and the only way to get it, as I said, it's like lifting weights. You can't you can't. There's no shortcuts in in life. You have to just. In fact, it's the opposite. You have to purposefully take the longest possible route because that's the only way to get good at anything. And um, that fucking sucks. It really fucking sucks and I hate it. Um, And so I try and not do it for as many things as I can possibly not do it for. But if you take shortcuts, it's going to come back to bite you in the ass later. It's like programming. If you take some shortcut, if if you do some... If you, if you, if you find a bug and you, and you sort of like patch it with with like a shitty fucking workaround, uh, it's going to come back to bite you in the ass 10 times harder later. You have to put in the effort now. Um, you know, it's all good to say this, but it's a different thing to actually do it. And on that issue, I don't know. I don't fucking know. I think it's just a matter of having of just doing it over and over and over again until your brain figures out that it can overcome itself 